Okay, I think I'm recording. <clears throat> so, welcome to my talk, Prime Cuts, the best pieces of Pony. Like I said, my name is Andrew Turley, and this is the Pony Virtual Users Group. A little bit about me. Uh, as I said, my name is Andrew Turley. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, sometimes I tweet about Pony, sometimes I tweet about other things, but I'm at Cassio Juarez, and my email address is aturley at acm.org. Um, I have been a computer programmer in a professional capacity for the last 15 almost 16 years. I've done a lot of different things in my career. Uh, some of them I've done reasonably well, others less well. I'm currently working at Sendence, um, which you may or may not have heard of, but we're basically the main user of the Pony programming language. So I wanna start off with what Pony is. People ask, what is Pony? If you go to the ponylang.org website, you'll see this description. Pony is an open source, object-oriented, actor model, capability secure, high performance programming language. What exactly does that mean? So open source, uh, pretty straightforward. It's BSD licensed, so there's not a whole lot of limits to what you can do with it. You can check us out on GitHub, you can create your own fork, you can do whatever you want. It's an object-oriented language. It has classes, interfaces, and traits, which are things that you're probably used to if you've used an object-oriented language before. Um, but it's worth pointing out that in Pony, they may work a little bit differently than what you're used to. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Um, it uses the actor model. Actors communicate by passing messages to other actors. You may be familiar with this from languages like Erlang or systems like Aka. Uh, basically, actors run independently and they pass messages back and forth to each other to communicate. It's capability secure. This means a few things, but the primary thing that we're gonna focus on in this talk is that the compiler enforces what you can and cannot do with an object. So if you have a reference to an object, there are some things that you'll be able to do with that and some things that you won't be able to do with that. It's a high performance programming language. It uses the LLVM to compile the Pony source code into native code. So there's no virtual machine. You are running your code directly on the hardware. So all the fun of bare metal. Uh, two other things to point out. Uh, Pony has a very powerful type system with things like unions, intersections, parameterized types and functions. Um, and also it has fast actor-based garbage collection. So it's a memory managed system. You don't have to take care of uh, freeing memory once you've allocated it. And there's a fairly sophisticated system behind managing these objects. I'm not gonna talk much about that in this talk, but there are papers online that you can read about it. It's, I think, really interesting, but I'm also a garbage collection nerd, so your mileage may vary. So let's take a quick look at a Pony program. Hello Pony. Um, as with most Hello World programs, there's not a whole lot to see here. Uh, but the important things are that your, the main entry point into your program is an actor called main. And when that actor gets created in Hello Pony, it prints out Hello World using this environment object that's passed into it. Again, not terribly exciting. Let's look at something maybe a little more interesting that shows off some of the other pieces of Pony. Um, so this is a program that will calculate the area of different kinds of shapes. And in this particular case, we've got a circle and a square. So this is a fairly straightforward kind of object-oriented example. So let's look at some of the pieces. <laughs> um, first of all, we have this thing, trait shape. So traits give us what's called nominal subtyping. And what that means is that we can say, okay, we have another class and that class is of type shape. So you see that the circle and square classes uh, are of this type shape. 
And that means that they'll implement the functions that are listed in shape. And so in this particular case, shape has an area function. Um, and then you can also see over here in the area reporter, we take uh, objects that are of type shape and that also uh, implement the named interface, which we'll get to in a second here. So the next thing we have is interfaces. Uh, we have this named interface. <clears throat> what interfaces do is they give us what's called structural subtyping. And what that means is that we don't have to explicitly say that a, another class is of this type. As long as we implement the function of that type that, or, uh, th that's specified in that interface, then we are automatically of that type. So if you look at the circle and square classes, they both implement this name function that returns a string. And so they are, uh, they implement the named interface even though they don't necessarily specify that they are of that type. So this kind of gives you a way of doing something, not exactly like duct typing, but it gives you a little more flexibility when creating objects and creating kind of hierarchies in that you can say, you can include something in a particular type without necessarily having to subclass it explicitly. So we have these two classes, uh, circle and square. And again, this gets this should look fairly straightforward if you've done any object-oriented programming. Uh, we have methods, and those methods do different things uh, to calculate the area, depending on whether it's a circle or a square. Then we have this primitive area reporter over here. Uh, primitives are objects with no data and only one instance. So everything in Pony uh, is an object of some kind. In some cases, though, you don't necessarily want to have to have a class and then instantiate an object. Primitives give you a way to have something that's kind of like a singleton in the sense that there's only one of them that gets created for the program and you can pass it around like an object and, and treat it like one, but you don't have to ever really explicitly instantiate it. And then in our main class, we, we do our work. Uh, so we have S, which is a variable that holds 15.3. And then we call uh, area reporter on a circle where we give it the value of, of S and a square where we give it the value of S. And in both cases, we print out the area uh, of those shapes. So if we compile the string using, or this program using Pony C, and then we run the program, uh, we end up with uh, this output. The area of the circle is 735.45, and the area of the square is 234.09. So that was an example. Now let's uh, talk about the really interesting parts of Pony. Pony uses actors and reference capabilities to allow the compiler to guarantee that a program is data race free. This is really what sets Pony apart from just about any other programming language that's out there. So again, the, the important thing to remember here is that your program is data race free. Again, take that home, data race free. Data race free, this is the important part about Pony. This is the really interesting part, and this is why you should be interested in learning Pony. Take this away, data race free. So let's talk about that. Let's go off to the data races. So let's say that we have some code uh, like this, and this is not Pony, this is kind of my own hybridized JavaScript C um, sort of thing. Uh, but we have a global variable called a, and then we have a function called inc, which increments the value of that global variable a, and then our main function uh, calls inc, and then prints out the value of a. So what we expect to get here um, is one, one million as our output, uh, and hopefully it's pretty straightforward looking at this, that that's really not an unusual or unexpected output. 
So let's say that now we want to have this be threaded. Let's say that we want to have two threads that both call the inc function and increment the value of that global variable a. So I've kind of made up a thread syntax here, but what we're doing is we create two threads that call the inc function. Uh, we run them, so they're running simultaneously. And then we use that join function there to wait for both of them to finish running. And then we print out the value of a. Since we have two threads incrementing, what we would expect to get would be 2 million, since each of them increments the value of a uh, once, or each of them increments it a million times, really. So we expect to get 2 million. But if anyone has ever run anything like this, you probably know that you're not going to get that. What you're actually going to do is you're going to run it a few times, and each time you're going to get a value that's slightly less than 2 million. So I have some example outputs here from different runs of a program like this. Why is that? Again, if you've done this before, you probably know the answer. Um, if not, let's just kind of step through what happens here. We have two threads that are running. And so in both cases, we first uh, get the value of a, and we add one to it, and we store that back into the global variable a. So if a is 26, we're doing this in two places. So first we get the value of a in both threads. And this may or may not happen at exactly the same time in each case, but sometimes you'll have these two threads running at the same time. So they both get the value of a, which is 26. And then they add one to that value that they've gotten. And so now they each have 27. And so now they write that new value back into a. So we did this twice, we expected to get 28, but really a now equals 27. So as I said, this may not happen every time, but each time it happens, we increase the size of our error. And when you're talking about increasing the size of the error, uh, in most cases, there's not really a size of error. You're either getting the right value or you're not getting the right value. So in this case, we now have the wrong value. Uh, shared mutable state is the root of all evil, as a number of different people have said in the past. So there are various techniques for avoiding this kind of race condition. Um, the first one is locks, which you'll see in C and C++. Basically what that means is that a unit of execution acquires a lock, and while it holds the lock, no other unit of execution can acquire that lock until it's released. And so. You can only have one thing holding the lock, and as long as everybody obeys the rule that you have to have the lock to execute a piece of code, then you can avoid a data race. The people who created Java said, well, that's um, everybody has to follow the rules here. Let's just make this a little more explicit and implement the locks for people. And so they created this idea of synchronized blocks functions methods. Um, or didn't create it, but they implemented Java this way. Uh, there are other languages that use constructs like this, but basically instead of explicitly saying I have a lock, you just tell the compiler, hey, I have this piece of code that should only ever be run by one thread at a time, and then the compiler does that for you. Uh, another approach is to make everything read only, so you can't ever modify a value once you've created it. At that point, you don't need to worry about writes anymore because there aren't any writes. Um, Erlang is one of several languages that does things like this. Then there's the approach of saying there's only one binding to any object at any time. And then you have ways of describing that. You have things like move, borrow, and copy. Um, so Rust implements something like that. Uh, Basically, they have a uh, set of semantics for describing this sort of behavior. So Pony has its own way of handling things like that, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, so the first thing to know is that Pony uses two rules to avoid data races. Uh, the first rule is the read rule. If an actor can read an object, then no other actor can modify that object. The second rule is the right rule. If an actor can modify an object, then no other actor can read or modify it. 
And so these two rules together help us, or basically allow us to avoid data races. And we'll talk a little bit about how exactly that happens, but first let's talk a little bit more about what actors are. Uh, actors store state and act on that state in response to messages. So actors have some uh, values that they hold and they receive messages and they take those messages and then do things to the values that they hold. So this is kind of what an actor looks like explained graphically. There's a queue of messages and again the actor holds state and then actors have behaviors uh, which respond to different types of messages and then they have functions which they can call uh, to do their work. So the first thing that an actor does in its life cycle is that it gets the next message on the queue. Once it gets that message, it takes it and it processes it. And in the process, it, when processing it, it, it can, it may send messages out to other actors or it may just update its own internal state. Um, once that's done, then it does garbage collection. So this is specifically in Pony, uh, garbage collection only happens in between processing messages. And once garbage is collected, uh, it gets the next message on its queue. Uh, in reality, messages are processed in batches, that way we don't overdo the garbage collection. So if you look at the Pony source code, uh, there's a batch size that controls how many messages are processed before the next round of garbage collection is done. Uh, actors run on threads. So by default with Pony, if you start up a Pony program, each CPU that you have gets a thread and all actors are assigned to a certain thread. So when you create an actor, it then becomes associated with a thread. That helps avoid having to move information between cores. If the uh, actor always executes on the same core, then you're able to keep more things in memory. Um, so behaviors, which are the things that process messages, cannot be preempted. So we have this thing here where, where actor A2 is running the Baz uh, behavior. And in that case, actor A1 can't interrupt that. Um, it could run, A1 could potentially run on another thread, but A2 will not be interrupted on that thread for another behavior to, uh, to take place. Um, an idle thread can steal work from another thread. So in this example, actor A1 runs on CPU1 on thread one, but if CPU2 is idle, and uh, thread one is handling actor A2, then CPU2 could steal the work and process the behavior for A1. I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn off notifications here real quick. I didn't realize I hadn't done that. All right, sorry about that. Um, so the next thing is that actors can process one message at a time. An actor, you, you can't have two behaviors processing two different messages for the same actor at the same time. Actors are effectively single threaded. So actors have references to objects and to other actors. So in this particular example, Things that start with A are actors and things that start with O are objects. And actor A1 has references to actor A2, A3, and to object one. Uh, actor two has references to uh, A3 and object one. And A3 doesn't have references to anything. References can be used to read data from an object, to write to an object, 
or to send messages to another actor. So if you have a reference to an actor, you can send it a message. Reference capabilities uh, control whether reads and writes are allowed via a given reference. Any reference can be used to send a message. So again, if you have a reference to an actor, you can always send that actor a message. But reference capabilities control whether or not you can read or write to an object. Uh, one thing to note is that sending a message is not the same as reading or writing. And so, again, even if you are in a situation, and there are situations where you can't read or write to the actor or to an object, uh, if it's an actor, you can still send it a message. So let's look at an example of a program that uses actors. This program has three different actors. It has the main actor, it has an example actor, and it has an other actor. So the main actor controls the behavior of the program. The example actor stores a string, and every time you call, you send it a foo message, the foo behavior is run, and that reverses the string that it's storing, and then sends it on to the actor that it's given a reference to. It passes a message off to that actor's same uh, behavior. So we'll just walk through this. When a program starts, the main actor is instantiated and a create message is sent to it. So if you have an actor and you have a create uh, behavior, if you have a create, it's a behavior, that means that your actor will receive a message. So the, run, the pony runtime creates an instance of that actor and sends it the create message. So in our program, the main actor begins to process this create message. Uh, the first thing it does is it creates an instance of this example actor and passes it the string howdy. Uh, the next thing it does is it creates an other object, an, an, or sorry, an instance of the other actor and sends it the env uh, variable as an argument. Now env stands for environment and we'll talk about that a little bit. Basically what it does is it controls, it gives you methods for doing things like printing and looking at the arguments that were passed to the program. Next, the main actor sends a foo message to the example actor. Simultaneously, the example actor sets the value of its text field. So it starts processing that create message. And the other actor sets the starts processing its create message and sets its inv field. Uh, now the main actor sends a foo message to the, uh, another foo message to the example actor. In this step, the example actor processes the first foo message that it received and calls the rev method, which reverses the uh, text string. So now the text string is howdy backwards. Uh, the example actor then sends the string to the other actor in a same message. So it, it creates the same message and passes that over, sends it over to the other actor. In this step, the example actor processes the second foo message, which again causes the string uh, stored in text to be reversed. And at the same time, the other actor processes the same message, which causes it to print the string that it received, which in this case is howdy spelled backwards. In this step now, the example actor sends another same message to the other actor. And then the other actor processes that message and again prints out howdy uh, because this, the, howdy, uh, the string that it received was now howdy spelled forward. Finally, all of the messages have been handled and the program exits. So this is, as I said, uh, an example of how actors interact with each other by message passing in Pony. Let's talk about reference capabilities. 
<clears throat> so the important things to remember for reference capabilities are these two rules, the read rule and the write rule. The read rule says that if an actor can read an object, then no other actor can modify that object. And the write rule says that if an actor can modify an object, then no other actor can read or modify it. Now this is important um, and, and it may, may seem a little confusing right now, but we're gonna spend most of the rest of this talk kind of talking about how those things work. Reference capabilities control whether a given alias can be used to read or modify an object. So an alias is a name that you've given things. So you can think of it as a variable. The collection of reference capabilities for an alias that refer to an object must be consistent with the read rule and the write rule. So you can have more than one alias that refers to an object and the reference capabilities for all those aliases control what those aliases can do. Any alias to an actor, regardless of its reference capability, can be used to send, a, send messages to that actor. So if you have a reference to, I've mentioned this, if you have a reference to an actor, you can use that reference to send a message. There are six different reference capabilities. Uh, the first is ISO, which means that only one alias can be used to read or modify an object. So if you have an alias that's ISO, um, you can use that alias to read and modify an object. And as long as that ISO alias exists, it is the only alias that can be used to read and modify the object. Uh, TRN, which stands for transitional, means that only one alias can modify the object. In that case, it's this alias. But more than one alias can be used to read the object. So you could have a TRN alias and you could have other aliases that could read but none of those other aliases could write to the object. Um, val means that no alias can modify this object, but more than one alias can read from it. Ref, more than one alias can read from this object and more than uh, one alias can modify this object. So you can have lots of aliases out there and they can read and write to the object. Uh, hopefully everybody's still there. I'm getting messages that I may have been logged out at some point. Um, so again, if you missed any of this, it's being recorded. Um, or you can shout at me and tell me that you missed something important. Um, so ref means that more than one alias can read from this object and more than one alias can modify this object. I think I already said that. Um, box means that this alias can be used to read an object and there may uh, be more than, there may not be uh, more than one alias that can modify it. Um, box is a little weird. We're, I'm going to go through these in a little more detail. Uh, and tag means that this alias cannot be used to read or modify this object, but it can be used to send a message or to the, to the actor or to do an identity comparison. So those are the six reference capabilities. So let's talk about where reference capabilities can appear. Uh, reference capabilities can appear uh, as part of a variable parameter or field declaration. So you, in this case, we can say let foo um, equal foo. What this does is it creates a new foo object uh, and it, use, it assigns it to this little case foo uh, alias. And so the alias, the alias's reference capability is ref. Um, reference capabilities can appear in actor and class declarations. So you can see something like class val foo. And what that means is that anytime you see foo used as a type, it actually means foo val, unless that's otherwise specified. So you can override that by explicitly uh, saying it's a foo of another type. But by default, if you've done this, then any foo that's used as a type means foo val. Um, you can use it, you'll see it in constructor declarations. So 
uh, constructors are when you, you say something is new, <coughs> uh, and, and when the methods definition says new. <coughs> and that means that objects of this class when created with this constructor will have this particular reference capability. So in this case, if you use this create method to create a new object, that object's uh, reference capability will be val. Uh, you'll see it in function declarations. So if we have a function called bar and we have the ref reference capability there, that means that bar's receiver must have a reference capability of ref. So the receiver is the object that you are calling that method on. So in this particular case, if you have, say, a dot bar, a has to be has to have a reference capability of ref, or you won't be able to use this method on it. You'll also see it in function return values. Um, so in this case, fun uh, f will always return a string that has a reference capability of ref. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about recover blocks in this talk, but you'll see them from time to time. Uh, effectively, recover blocks give you a way of saying, okay, I've got an, I, I'm within the recover block, I'm going to create an object that has a certain reference capability. And once it's returned from the recover block, it gets a, that object will have a more restrictive reference capability. And so you can, uh, use recover blocks to, for example, take a ref, do some things with it and get it back outside of the ref uh, of the recover block as in this example, as an ISO. If no reference capability is specified, the default reference capability for the given object is used. So uh, we talked a little bit about that. Um, in, for example, in the case of a class, you could say class val foo, and that would mean that uh, foo always has a val. If you, don't, if you don't say that, then by default, classes will have a reference capability of ref. So let's look at a quick example here. Um, here's a piece of pony code on the right. So the first thing to do is spot the reference capabilities that have been specified. So here we have class val bar, and that means that anytime you see bar used as a type, um, that actually means bar val. Then we have new val create in the bar class, and what that means is that any bar object that you create will have a type of uh, val. And then we have uh, down there in main, in the create, we have foo iso, which means that A is going to be a foo object with an iso reference capability. So then we can take a look at the implied reference capability. So remember that if you don't specify a reference capability, then the default reference capability is used. So that class foo is actually class ref foo, which means that anytime we have uh, a foo type, foo used as a type somewhere, it actually means foo ref. Um, that u32, u32s have a default reference capability of val. Um, the actor, actors have a default reference capability of tag. The environment type, env, has a default reference capability of val. Um, that recover, by default, uh, because the type is ISO, the recover will recover to an ISO. Uh, the variable uh, B in main, uh, Pony will do, will figure out the, the type of an object for you and will also figure out the reference capability for you, but because it's a bar, and because bar, uh, the bar class has a default reference capability of val, um, b is by default a bar val. And then fun, the, the baz function has a reference capability of box, which means that all callers of that function have to be of type box. And 
within Baz, the argument C uh, is of type bar. And again, as we've discussed, bar has a default or has a type a reference capability of val because we specified that when we specified the class. And again, U32s have a default reference capability of val. So that's kind of what we went through here. Again, actors uh, have a default reference capability of tag, classes of ref. Um, so normally uh, a class would have a default reference capability of ref. We've changed it here to val. And same thing with um, constructors. They would re usually by default return a ref an object with a ref capability. So in this case, we've said that everything that's returned by this constructor has a reference capability of val. And down here, you can specify the type of a reference capability that the receiver must have. So again, by default, this uses box. Reference capabilities can get really tricky. Um, one of the hardest things when you start using Pony is trying to figure out reference capability related errors uh, because you'll have to start, you basically get thrown into it right from the get go. Uh, as I discussed, an alias can name a, is a name that's given to a particular object in memory. Uh, aliases are created when an object is assigned to a variable and also when an object is passed as a, an argument to a method. So think of it as different times when a name is given to an object in memory. Um, again, an object can have more than one alias, possibly in more than one actor, <clears throat> but the combination of aliases must not violate the read rule and the write rule. And again, the read rule is that if an actor can read an object, then no other actor can modify that object. And the write rule is, if an actor can modify an object, then no other actor can read or modify it. So let's walk through reference capabilities uh, a little more closely. I've got kind of a visual guide to reference capabilities here. So the first reference capability is ISO, and that means that the reference can read and modify an object. No other object, no other reference can read or modify that object. So uh, if you look here, we have an actor A, which has an alias one that points to object, and there can't be any other aliases to it that can read or modify that object. And again, that's because of the read rule and the write rule. We can't have anything else that can read. Uh, if the actor can read an object, then no other actor can modify that object. And if an actor can modify an object, then no other actor can read uh, or modify it. So ISO is very restrictive, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about what exactly that means and what you can do with an ISO object. TRN, uh, transitional, uh, means that an alias can read and modify an object. No other reference can modify the object, but the actor may have other references, other aliases that can read the object. So again, in this case, Actor A can have two aliases, and if one of them is transitional, then the other alias could read from that object, but it can't write to it. Otherwise, that would violate the read rule and the write rule. A ref alias can read and modify an object. Other references uh, in the actor may be able to read or modify the object but no other actor may have a reference that can read or modify it. And so again, if, if we follow the read and write rule, alias two is allowed to read and write from the object because that, that doesn't violate either of those rules. But alias three couldn't read or write from the object because uh, actor A already has an alias that can write to it. A val alias can re read an object. Uh, the actor may have other references that can read the object, and other actors may have references that can read the object, but no actor may have a reference that can modify it. So again, the read and the write rule are not violated. Um, 
if an actor can read from an object, then no other actor can modify that object. So that holds here. And if an actor can modify an object, then no other actor can read or modify it. Box gets a little trickier. Um, box means that you can either have a box alias means that there's either no other aliases that can write to that object, or it means that there may be another alias that can read or write to it, but if that's the case, then no other actor can have an alias that can read or write to that object. So either way, an alias with a reference capability of box is a read-only alias. Uh, so what box really does is, is it's more about controlling what the other aliases are. Um, so if you look at it, you'll notice that in the top case, this looks a lot like the rules for a val. And in the bottom case, this looks a lot like the rules for a ref. And effectively, a box capability is used when you want to create a new read-only reference to an object that is either val or ref. So why might you want to have something like that? Well, if we have a <coughs> program like this, where we have a function bar down there in main, and we want to be able to either pass references or vowels to it, we need to be able to figure out what we need to be able to have a way of saying what the type of that particular alias is. So if you look down there at, at X, we need to be able to have a way of saying, hey, this can take either a ref or a val. We're never going to write to this alias, but we do need to read it. And so remember that you can read from either a ref or a val alias. So we need to be able to specify what that uh, reference capability for X is. So let's say that we make it ref. Well, ref doesn't work uh, because we can't alias a val, the, the, the B variable that we've created. If we passed B to it, that would violate the reference capability rules, and so that wouldn't work. So what if we make X a val? We say, okay, uh, the type is val. Well, that doesn't work either because now we can't alias a ref. So let's say that we say that X's reference capability is box. This works because now we can alias either a ref or a val. So again, box says, I don't care what the other reference capabilities are as long as I can get a readable reference to a readable alias to this object. The final reference capability is tag. A tag reference, a uh, tag alias cannot read or modify an object, but it can be used to send the object messages if that object is an actor, or it can be used to compare identity. Uh, other references may read or modify the object as long as they do not violate the read rule and the write rule. So there may be other aliases out there, as in this example, um, that can read and write to the object, Tag just says that a particular alias can neither read nor write to the object. So there are five readable reference capabilities, ISO, transitional, ref, val, and box. And that means that if you have an alias of this kind, you can use that alias to read from the object. There are three different reference capabilities that are writable. ISO, transitional, and ref. So again, if you have a, an alias with a reference capability of ISO, transitional, or ref, you can write data to that object. And then we have three reference capabilities that are called sendable, uh, ISO, val, and tag. What that means is that objects uh, with sendable reference capabilities can be sent to other actors using messages. So if you have an alias that is ISO, val, or tag, that object can be sent from one actor to another. Uh, the remainder of the reference capabilities, if you have an alias 
to an object with one of those reference capabilities, then the, uh, the object itself cannot be sent to another actor. So let's take a look at sending a vowel from one actor to another. So we create a main actor. We have a, uh, and then we create a foo actor and we have a reference to it called F. And then we get a bar object whose type is val. And then we send that bar object over to the foo uh, actor uh, using a baz message. And now in the, in the foo actor, um, the variable x is also an alias to bar. So the reason this works is that we can do this in the read rule and write rule are never violated. Uh, if an actor can read an object, then no other actor can modify that object. So if you look, um, there's no, uh, there are no objects, there are no aliases that can be used to modify the bar object. And the right rule, if an actor can modify an object, then no other actor can read or modify it. So as you can see, there's nothing that can modify that object. And so uh, the two rules are, are fine. So let's look at sending a tag. A uh, tag is pretty similar. Uh, remember that an actor's default reference capability is tag. So again, we create a main actor, we create a foo actor, and we have a reference to it called foo, or called f. Um, we then create a bar actor and store that in, or create an alias to it called B in main. And then we send that bar actor, or send a reference to that bar actor over to foo. Foo now has an alias uh, called X. And again, the read rule and the write rule are maintained uh, because there's nothing, there, there's no alias that can be used to read bar. Uh, and there's no alias that can be used to write the bar, so our aliases are all okay. So now let's send, look at sending an ISO. So we've modified our program again. So we come through, we create a main uh, actor. We create the foo actor and a reference to it. And we create a bar, uh, object. So in this case, again, bar is an object, not an actor like it was last time. And now we want to send that, send a, a, a alias to that bar actor over to foo. So what we do is we use consume and consume causes B to give up its reference or it's it, B no longer aliases that object once you call consume on it. Once we consume B, we can no longer use B as an alias. But now we can send it in this message over to Foo. And once Foo gets it, it now has an alias X to that object. So again, once this set of operations is complete, the read rule and the write rule are safe. We haven't violated them. But remember, we've, we've had to give up a reference at B to the bar object so that we can then create a new reference to it in foo. So these rules are in place, again, as a way of saying, we are always going to maintain these invariants, and these invariants are the read rule and the write rule. And then it's up to the programmer to do the right thing to make sure that those invariants are maintained. And what Pony does is if those invariants are not maintained, it's a compiler error. So really important thing to remember is that you can do things like this in basically any language that gives you threads. But in most languages, the compiler can't enforce this sort of thing. And so you're left as a programmer to your own devices to make sure that you are not violating these rules. Pony, because it lets you describe reference capabilities as part of the type for an alias, 
gives you the ability to check these things in the compiler rather than having them checked at runtime, which means that if you get them wrong, your program crashes. So Pony saves you a lot of time that you might have otherwise had to spend hunting down these kinds of subtle uh, multi-threading issues. And that gives you a situation where you don't have to worry about data races. So let's look at this program that we wrote, uh, the, uh, that we were looking at at the beginning of this talk, um, where we have two threads that are incrementing a global variable. And when we run this program, we never really get the expected value. We always get something less because there's a race condition in our code. So if we were describing the problem, we could say that this program <laughs> violates the read rule and the write rule because the variable A can be read and modified from multiple threads. So here's the first pass at a pony equivalent of that program. Uh, we have a counter which stores a value and that value can be incremented. And then we have this incrementer which increments uh, the value of the counter. Um, it was supposed to be a million times but typo. We're, we're only doing it 100,000 times here. Um, but then we create uh, two actors and we call the do it uh, behavior on them. And then we print out the value at the end. So the reason this doesn't work is that the two increment actors try to read and write to the counter. So if you tried to compile this in Pony, Pony would throw in an error and you'd get a compiler error that would tell you that there was a problem with reference capabilities. So I've reworked this a little bit. It's a little more complicated now, but this is an example that works. And the reason that it works is that now um, we are careful with our making sure that we are not violating the read rule and the write rule. So the counter has an increment behavior and a print behavior. So the in increment behavior means that the incrementer sends the counter increment messages. And so as we see here, the incrementer when it is created, uh, loops a million and one times and calls that uh, and, and sends that increment message to the counter. And then when it's finished, it calls main finished. So over here in the main uh, actor, we set up our environment variable, and then we create two of these incrementer objects. And again, the incrementer objects, when they increment, they are sending messages to the counter. And if, as you remember, we talked about earlier, uh, the counter is effectively single threaded. And so it handles those increment messages one at a time and increments its counter. And then when we're done, we call this finished, we, we send the main actor this finished method and the main actor then prints out the value from the counter. And now we should get the correct value, which is 2 million. So when you're talking about actors, what, what people will say is that the counter actor protects the counter data structure. It provides a way for other actors to tell it to do something to that data structure, but it doesn't give them direct access to that data structure so that they could read and write to it. So that's basically the good parts of Pony. Pony, as I said, gives you a way of writing data race free programs. So like I said, I work at Sendence, we use Pony. And I'll just talk a little bit about our experience with Pony. Uh, the first thing is that it's nice to catch errors at compile time rather than runtime. So all those data race related errors, um, we avoid those altogether. And that's been great for writing a system that uses multiple actors. Um, Pony is a young language. It's not even at 1.0 yet. So we're improving things, but the documentation is a little limited. 
sometimes things change in the API. And there are definitely some sharp edges, but we're also working hard to fix those things. And it's open source, so there's a lot of people out there who are helping us improve the situation. Uh, as Eleanor Roosevelt once said, America is all about uh, speed, hot, nasty, badass speed. Pony is fast. Um, we really haven't had too many complaints in terms of performance. And when there are performance issues, it's usually because we are doing something that just needs to be incredibly fast. And we um, end up looking at it. And when we've run into those bottlenecks, we've usually been able to find fixes within the Pony compiler, or we've changed the way that we're doing things to work a little more with the grain. So I've left a lot out of this talk. Um, like I said, I really only focused on a few parts of Pony. So there are some ways to learn more. There's the mailing list, uh, which is handled by Groups.io. There is the website, which you can go to at uh, ponylang.org. And there's the free node channel in IRC, uh, PonyLang. If you want to contribute to Pony, there's the developer mailing list, again, on Groups.io. Uh, and we're on GitHub, so you can go to GitHub and you can take a look at the Pony compiler. There's also an RFC process for proposing changes to the language, and so you can go to PonyLang RFCs, take a look at the existing uh, RFCs, and if you want to contribute, you can propose an RFC, and it will be discussed by the community. Thank you for your time here. And are there any questions? I had a question. Um, this is Alex Khan. Um, you said you're using Pony in production. Is it your main language that you're using for most of your services, or is it a certain part of your system with some other languages and other roles? Um, it's the main language that we're using for our system. Wow, cool. Yeah, so we, uh, we do everything in Pony. Um, I guess with the caveat that we are building some APIs for our system so that you can use right now C++, but eventually some other languages. But the the uh, the application framework that we've built is all in Pony. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, very much for coming by. Um, I'm not sure that we've picked a topic for the next virtual users group. But if you're um, interested, you should get in touch with Sean Allen. Uh, best way to do that is probably through the one of the mailing lists that I've mentioned. Um, so yeah, please feel free to check it out, contribute. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please hit up the mailing list or the IRC channel, or hit me up in uh, Twitter or at my email address. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Yep.